Uh, before I start the sermon today, I actually get to do a kingdom moment update for you. And I even have a slide that hopefully will work to show you. <laughs> there it is. Okay, great. Okay, I'll stand here a little bit to the side. So uh, as I've said a few times here in church, one of the biggest challenges that uh, we've faced in planting a church, for those of you that are new here, we're planting a church, Lord willing, in January 16th called Christ the King. Uh, yeah, woohoo. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we've faced has been finding a space. And, uh, you know, sometimes people come up to me and say, Jesse, what do you even do? No, nobody said that, actually. But, um, but I spent a lot of my time over the last year looking for spaces. And this is a graphical representation of how I've spent a lot of my time. And those are skull and crossbones to show that those people are dead to me. Well, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I've knocked on a lot of doors. I've asked to use a lot of spaces. I spent one evening in the basement of a church celebrating the 75th uh, 75th birthday of an Indonesian pastor who was retiring, and that didn't work. I, uh, I, I spent time going to this one place near my house. It's a church that is right near my house that I drive past all the time. I call them a bunch of times, no answer. And so every time I'd go past a church, I'd wiggle the door, and uh, nobody would come to the door. And then once after four months, I went by, wiggled the door. The pastor came out, said, finally, I get to meet you. And he's like, why are you so excited? And uh, so I, got, I went inside. I got to meet him. We sat down. We had this great conversation. I called him back and said, hey, so uh, we're looking to plant a church. We're seeing if we can use the space. Nope, that didn't work. And so we went through space after space after space after space after space. And my original announcement as of Wednesday was going to be, I don't know if you can see, oh, you can't see it behind the drums there. There was a, that's where Wellspring is in Englewood. It has a prayer icon. My original announcement was going to say, please pray for us because we have one space left, that yellow one right there called Salem. Please pray for us because we need that space. It's literally, as you can see, like the last, the last possible location we could go to. They were having a council meeting on Tuesday. Well, since I put this slide together, they actually called me on Thursday and said that we can use their space. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. And my girl said, Dad, why are you running around the house so much? It was awesome. It was the best news that we ever could have gotten because I was already starting to make contingency plans in my mind. Maybe we should get pushed back. Maybe we should look in a different area. But we are so excited that God has blessed us with this space. And I sent out an email to the folks that are coming with a church plan. I gave them six reasons we love the space. One is it's available. Need I say more? I mean, it's available for only $600 a month as well. Two, it's a perfect size. It's a smaller sanctuary. It can fit up to 120, but it won't feel empty if 50 people show up. So it's a great place to, to, grow, uh, to grow as a congregation. The third one, it has this really classical feel, sort of like Wellspring here. And so that we're excited to infuse vibrant worship together with a sense of reverence to the Lord. Four, it has a giant front yard. And I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but we're thinking about doing a tent in the front in the summers or something like that. <laughs> It's got a giant dining hall, I call it the bingo hall, because it literally looks like an old bingo hall, so it'll be great. Uh, we'll be in the evening, so it'll be fun to do dinners after church together. We look forward to doing that. And most importantly, it's in an area that we've been praying about since we arrived, that, that mark there. Within a five-minute bike ride of any direction, you have a dramatically different set of people. You have million-dollar homes. You have subsidized housing. You have immigrant placement housing. It's not too far from I-25. It's over on the east side of 25. So it's literally everything that we've been praying for this entire time, and it came at the exact right time. So the God is good. God is good. We're super excited. January 16th, 4.30 p.m., Christ the King will begin. So we're super excited. Now, following that, <laughs> following that, we uh, we uh, get to start my sermon. So, as uh, Katie said, we're in the second Sunday of Advent, and uh, Advent is the season where we both look back at the first Advent of Jesus and we think about all the things that that means for us here and now in our lives. And it's also the time when we look forward to the second Advent of Jesus and we say, "Come, Lord Jesus," and we live with this deep hope that He will return. And one of the things that I love about the church calendar and the lectionary, which is a set of readings that goes along with the church calendar, 
is that it forces you to address the full counsel of God as it's revealed in the scriptures. You can't just pick and choose the parts of the Bible you like. You actually preach through the entire Bible if you're following the lectionary. Now, one of the things I don't like about the church calendar and the lectionary is that it forces you to deal with the whole counsel of God as it's revealed in the scriptures, and you can't just pick and choose the parts of the Bible that you like. And uh, today's passage that you heard in Malachi chapter 3 puts us on the more challenging side of things because it's going to talk to us about how among many things, among the many things that Jesus came to be and do in our midst, he is the refiner, he is the purifier of his people. And so I'm just going to warn you ahead of time, this passage that we're looking at today, at first glance at least, doesn't feel very Adventy. <laughs> So if you came here expecting a a peppy Christmas sermon today, you're wrong. (laughs) But my hope is, my hope is that as we explore this passage together, we'll come to see that it's actually, actually very, very, very good news that Jesus came as, among many things, the refiner and purifier of his people. So let me just pray for us as we jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your scriptures, which are your revelation to us for how we can know you. So we pray as we open your scriptures that you would show yourself to us. We wouldn't learn them just for knowledge, but we would learn them so that we could know you, so that we could be drawn into a deeper life together with you. So we ask that you draw our hearts to things eternal that you'd break into our reality. We pray all of this in your great and holy name. Amen. Well, in the East Coast, where I'm from, on the uh, Canadian-New York border, there's a giant waterfall called Niagara Falls. And how many people have ever been to Niagara Falls? Now, if you've ever been there, you know that it's a magnificent waterfall. And one of the things you notice is that you can actually hear the roar of the falls from miles away. You don't have to be in front of the falls to be able to hear the roar of the falls. And residents who live around Niagara Falls are used to this sort of constant background roar that's going on in their lives. Well, one morning in 1848, the residents in the area woke up to a strange silence that they weren't used to. There was this silence that pervaded the area. And that was because the Niagara Falls actually ceased to flow. And it says, in the article that talks about it, it says, the reason was a strong southwest wind combined with freezing temperatures pushed the ice in Lake Erie in motion, and millions and millions of tons of ice became lodged at the mouth of the Niagara River at Lake Erie, blocking the channel completely. So the self-made dam held the water for approximately 30 hours as ice continued to build up and block the flow, and eventually, with some warming temperatures and pressure from the river, the river broke through, and Niagara Falls was able to flow again. Now, I think that this is a great image to describe the spiritual life of the people of God, and often is a good image for us as well, because the grace of God And the goodness of God and the blessings of God are always flowing towards his people. But at times, God's people can get into patterns in life or make decisions that cause them to freeze off their hearts to receiving the grace and goodness of God in their lives. And that's really what we're going to see happens here in the book of Malachi. So if you could open your Bibles to Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament right before Matthew Malachi is a prophet, and as a prophet, God sent him to call out God's people. And if you read through the book of Malachi, it's a set of conversations between Malachi and God's people that cover different topics. And so Malachi was sent to them, to God's people, because they really had departed from the way that God wanted them to live. They were making choices that weren't honoring God. They had fallen into patterns that didn't glorify God in what they were doing. And so if you read through the chapters that lead up to our chapter, uh, Malachi talks about how their justice system is corrupt, and they're taking advantage of the poor in the court systems. Or their priests even were corrupt. They were making impure offerings. Instead of offering their best to the Lord, they're offering their second, third, and fourth best to the Lord. 
The people were taking advantage of the poor, the orphan, the widow, and the sojourner. And so Malachi was sent to have a series of conversations between him speaking on behalf of God and the people of God as they were responding to him. And the conversation that we're jumping into is about halfway through the book, and it's, it comes on the heels of a really interesting question that the people of God actually ask of God. So to give us some context in Malachi 2.17, which is the verse right before our verses, it says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is this God of justice? Now, to me, it's really interesting that the people who were not living like the way that they should, who had departed from the ways of God, who were taking advantage of the people that were weaker, weaker than them, it's interesting to me that the people had the audacity to stand before God in the, in the lifestyles that they were living and look at God and say, where is this God of justice? And so Malachi is saying, by walking away from God, by living in sin, what you've done is you've frozen off your hearts, you've frozen off the nation to the goodness and blessings of God. And so as you're looking up, you're saying, where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? So that's the context. And then it jumps into our first verse here in Malachi 3, 1. Malachi, the, the people say, where is this God of justice? And Malachi says, he's coming, he's coming. Verse 3, 1 says this, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So as we know, from our perspective, Malachi is pointing forward to the first advent of us being able to say, Merry Christmas, the incarnate God is here among us. This is the messenger of the covenant, and he will appear. And then in the rest of the passage, Malachi talks about what this messenger of the covenant will do. And this is where I want to focus our energy. Because as we walk through these verses, I want to point out three really big pieces of good news that come, with, that come from what Jesus will come to do as he is the messenger of the covenant. So the first piece of good news we find in verse 2 and 3 is this. Even though it might sound harsh at times... Even though it might be difficult for us to hear at times, verses about purifying and refining are actually statements of value. So verse 2 says this, But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap or launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now, a refiner's fire is something that heats up an amalgam of metal in order to remove the impurities. The impurities float up to the top of a precious metal, and then they're scraped off. A fuller soap or launderer's soap is this really caustic, alkali soap that people used to take these linens out into a field. They would apply this powder soap. They'd stomp on those linens until they became white, and then they'd take them back in a city. And so what Malachi is saying is that this messenger of the covenant, this Lord of hosts, will refine and will purify like refiner's fire and fuller's soap. Now as we think about it, the reason someone refines silver is because pure silver has tremendous value. That's the reason someone refines something like silver. Because the refining process is actually quite challenging. It's energy intensive. You've got to apply a lot of heat. It's costly. You've got to spend money in refining. It's dirty as you're going through the refining process. It's even dangerous as you refine metals. In fact, if you've ever heard of Mad Hatter's disease, that uh, comes from when people were refining gold using mercury, and they would inhale so much mercury that they would literally go crazy. Refining is no small task, especially in these times. Refining is challenging, it's costly, it's expensive, and it's even dangerous. And so you only refine something if it has tremendous value. You don't refine scrap metal. You might melt it down, but you don't refine scrap metal. Silver, gold, on the other hand, those are worth refining. 
So if we consider our passage, it's a challenging passage because it's about refining and purifying in God's discipline. But underneath this idea of God refining and God purifying and God disciplining his people, there's God saying, do you understand how precious you are in my sight? Do you understand how much value that I place upon you? Do you understand who you are? You are my people and I value you. I refine you, I discipline you, because underneath that sin, behind that blindness of following in the patterns of the world, there is pure and utter value. Now, this is true for us as well as God's people, because guess what? Merry Christmas! The refiner and the purifier is here among us. And so the Bible tells us is that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he does many things. One of them is he gets rid of our sin, and he draws us into his family, and he calls us his own. And as part of being his own, he will refine us. And there are times where that will feel uncomfortable. There are times where it'll feel like someone has turned up the heat in our lives. But really underneath that, God is doing that. He is refining us because he places immeasurable value on his people. And in the refining process, he's uncovering that value to show the purity that he's placed within us. God's refining, God's discipline, God's purifying is a statement of value. You have value as God's people. Now, a few months ago, I got to take my kids to the Denver Museum, and they had this special exhibit there called the Mirror Maze. Anybody get a chance to go to the Mirror Maze? Nobody. Okay, well, the mirror maze is extremely disorienting because the mirrors are all set at angles where if you look at any direction, it looks like an infinity hall of mirrors. And it's done so well with the angle of the light that it literally looks like every place is a hallway. And so you end up coming out with a bruised forehead because you walk forward, you think, oh, this looks like a hallway, and you step forward and bang. You turn, and then you go this way, and then you walk a few steps. Oh, that looks like a hallway. And the most insidious part of this, I I I bet they have videos, and they just laugh at people, (laughs) put cameras in there. The most insidious part of it is they put in these cul-de-sacs or these fake hallways there where you actually can take five or six or seven steps in a direction only to then hit a mirror. (laughs) And it was fun because I had my kids lead me through it. It's super fun if you ever get the chance to to do it. But I think without realizing it, I think a lot of us can accidentally end up living our lives like we're in a mirror maze, where we are looking for value or validation in the world around us only to hit a series of dead ends and to feel completely disoriented about what life is all about. So there's the classic ones like seeking money as a sign of value and validation or career achievement or seeking the approval from the right cultural, social, or political crowd to make yourself feel like you have value or validation. Or maybe it's living a lot of experiences like going and living van life, and that, that'll give me value and validation in, in my life. Or even really good things, like the love of the right person, or having kids, and finding your value and validation in those things. If we look to find our ultimate value, our ultimate validation from anything in this world, the promise is we will hit dead ends. We will run into the mirror. Even if it looks like there's an infinity hall in front of us, we will always hit dead ends. But the good news is, is that we don't need anything else outside of ourselves or in the world to give us value or validation, because the Lord Almighty God counts us as valuable in his sight. He counts us as precious in his sight. And the closer you get to know the Lord, you know that there's no amount of value or validation from anything else in the world that comes even close to comparing with this presence of God that says you have value beyond anything else in the world. And I know many of you in the room have experience this. The closer you get to God, the more these external validators and places that we put our value fade away, and the more you can rest in this presence that because of God's love for us, we have eternal value. So God is coming as God is here, and he is coming as the refiner and the purifier, but he refines and purifies precious metal, not scrap metal. 
we have value in God's sight. Now, the second piece of good news I want to highlight in this passage is that the purpose of God's refining and purifying is to enable the people of God to experience more and more of his blessing. So in verse 4, it says this, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So what Malachi is saying on the heels of verse 2 and 3 is he's saying that the purpose of this refining, other than to show you that you have actual value, is to enable Judah at this time to re-enter into the blessing cycle of God as in the days of old. So if you go back into the days of old, into the Torah, into the first five books of the Bible, you'll see this pattern emerge where God says, you are my people, you are precious, you are set apart to be holy in my sight. And to do that, I've given you this guide, which is a way you should live to represent my goodness to the world. And if you walk in my ways, then I will bless you. And if you depart from my ways, then I will remove my blessing from you. And so what Malachi is saying is that as you return to the Lord, you will return back into this pattern of God blessing you. Now, the same is true for us as well as God's people. The purpose of God's refinement and his purifying in our lives and in our hearts is to open us up more and more to his goodness and his blessing in our lives. Now, when I say blessing and when I say goodness, I don't necessarily mean material wealth I don't mean health. I don't mean you'll always be happy all the time and life will be easy, although sometimes God will bless us with those things. And when I say blessing, please be sure I'm not talking about our status as his children. Because when God saves us and we enter into the family of God, we are his children, period, full stop, that never changes. We don't earn our way into his family. But when I do say blessing, I do mean things that the Bible talks about like this deep peace, this ability to be content in all circumstances, no matter what is going on around you. I do mean the opportunity to be more and more open to the Holy Spirit and to join God in the wonderful things that he's doing in the world, to take joy in joining together with God with how he's acting and moving in the world. This is the blessing. But when our lives are clouded by, by sin, or when we accidentally or unintentionally buy into the promises of the world, it can take us down the same path as God's people here where we walk away from God and we get into the patterns of the world and then we look up one day and we say, where's this peace? Where's this God of contentment that the Bible talks about? Where's this blessing that's supposed to be going on in my life? Meanwhile, we're sort of walking along in our own purposes. Well, guess what? The refiner is here. Merry Christmas! <laughs> this is part of why God refines us, that he would remove the impurities that are lodged in our hearts that he would reorient our walk and face our lives towards him, that he would dislodge the ice that we've allowed to build up in our hearts that block the flow of his blessing and goodness into our lives. This is what the refiner does. And just to emphasize this, what Malachi says in the rest of the chapter, verse 7, 10, and 12, I'll just summarize really fast. He says, return to me, this is speaking for the Lord, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Then I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now this is why we encourage all the time from the front to spend time with the Lord in prayer and in scriptures to press into community and walk with others, to, to walk along with the rhythms of the church. It's not to win a, some sort of religious Christian merit badge. It's not to look like a good Christian to others or, or to set up a lifestyle of legalism. It's none of that. But when we walk in the ways of the Lord and we actively seek him, what we're doing is we're orienting our lives to be open to God's blessing and his goodness in our lives. And the closer you walk to the Lord, the more you feel his peace and his contentment 
and his joy that transcends all circumstances. God wants us to know his goodness and his blessing. And so he says, turn back to me. Let my refining and purifying work act in your hearts. Final piece of good news, and I'll just end, end with this piece, is that there is this sense in all of the prophets where they are often pointing back to what has happened. Oftentimes they say, return back to the law, return back to God's goodness. So they're often pointing back to what's happened. They're often talking about what's happening presently, and they're often pointing forward to what will happen. You can see this pattern in all the prophets. And they often call the people to live with all three pieces together at once. Live back with what God told you. Live into the righteousness that God has for you now. Look forward to the hope that comes when God will come as the refining and purifying messenger of the covenant. Now in our liturgy, every single Sunday, we actually emphasize the exact same thing as the prophets. We say, and now we proclaim the mystery of our faith, or we say, now we proclaim the good news of the gospel, which is Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Amen. Christ has died. Christ has died. When he died, he purified us and refined us. He took all of our sin upon himself. He made us clean and righteous in the eyes of God. He took it all in himself. And by believing in his death on the cross, we are ushered in to his family and called his own and given tremendous value. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He's active. He's moving. He's alive. He's refining, purifying, remaking a people for himself. He's given us his spirit so that we could joyfully walk with him and proclaim his goodness to the world. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. He will refine. He will purify the world. And he will do that because he has tremendous love for the world, and he sees the world that has immeasurable value. And so one day, by his goodness, he will refine and purify away all sin. He will refine and purify away all the effects of sin. Injustice, disease, pain, suffering, loss, division. The Lord will refine all that away one day. And he will prepare the world to receive the fullness of his blessing, which is his unadulterated presence and his goodness. He will refine that all away. And the joy that we press into during Advent and the challenge that we press into at Ad Advent is that we're called to embrace all three of these at the same time. Christ has died We've been set free from sin. We have eternal value. Christ is risen. He's leading us through the mirror maze of life and showing us the right path. Christ will come again. He will make all things right. Do we live with that hope? Does that hope invade our reality today? Christ will come again. That's the answer to the question of the people in our passage in Malachi. Where is this God of justice? Where is this God of peace? Where is this God of contentment? Where is this God of joy? Christ has come, first advent. Christ will come again. That's our second advent. All praise be to his name. So Merry Christmas. Let's press into this advent season.